Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello everyone, uh, well, let us continue with our uh, discussion on flight dynamics uh, which is relevant for flight control design and which we will use it uh, subsequently in uh, in this uh, course especially. So, last lecture we have uh, derived uh, point mass equations uh, in various uh, assumptions and followed by uh, 6 degree of freedom equations where we have derived the dynamic part of the thing and then we will continue further on this uh, this particular lecture and try to uh, finish it off. I try, try to give a complete overview of this uh, this dynamics actually. Uh, so, this uh, 6 degree of freedom model what we discussed last class is uh, we, we essentially try to find a relationship in two coordinate systems. One is inertial frame which is uh, I mean you can visualize that as fixed on the surface of our some wave and then there is a body frame which is attached to the body and then about the body frame we discussed about several variables which we call as dynamic variables uh, which essentially consist of u v w and PQR. UVW are velocity components along body x, body y and body z and then uh, around those axes uh, there, there are some rotator, rotation uh, rates which are called roll rate, uh, pitch rate and, uh, and yaw rate. We have discussed that in detail before as well actually. And then we went ahead and, and uh, derived uh, this set of equations which essentially consist of uh, translational accelerations and rotational acceleration terms actually. And this uh, consists of uh, partly this uh, uh, Coriolis component and partly from gravity and partly due to external forces. Okay. And the, uh, similarly, we have these equations of uh, uh, for rotational rates and all that actually. So, we have done that in detail in previous class. Now, the, if you see that the, there are some uh, some quantities theta phi especially here which also vary with time because that, that represents the attitude of the vehicle. Okay. So, they are not fixed. So, they, they keep on varying with time. So, we certainly want to have a really, uh, I mean a rate of change of these variables as well. In addition the, to that, we also require this uh, this aerodynamic components here, this x, y, z and uh, l, m, n which are also functions of height because they are, they are functions of dynamic pressure and dynamic pressure uh, consists of uh, density of atmosphere which varies with height. So, we also we, we need to have a rate of change of height actually. And especially if you want to have a trajectory of the aircraft where it is going, what it is doing and things like that, if you want to visualize from some inner cell frame, then we certainly need to have x, y coordinates in the inner cell frame as well. So, inertial x, y, z, the z part, negative z part of it will essentially give us the height part of it, I mean the height of the aircraft at any point of time and x, y, z together will define this this coordinate uh, of the of the CG of the vehicle which will essentially give us the flight path tra trajectory. So, we need to have this uh, phi theta along with that we also need something called heading angle psi. So, we are essentially we want to derive phi dot theta dot psi dot as well as x dot y dot z dot in the inner cell frame actually. So, let us go ahead and try to do that. Those are called kinematic equations essentially. They do not uh, rely on the external forces and moments, but they are actually velocity level equations. What we saw here is acceleration level equations. Okay. So, now let us continue with our I mean derivation. So, here we need the concept of something called Euler angles and later we will see that this is not the only parameterization. We can also have uh, various other parameterization like direction cosine and quaternion things like that. But let us complete the derivation with uh, with Euler angles actually. So, what you really want here? There is there is inertial frame okay, here okay, and there is a body frame out here. Okay. So, we want to know the orientation of this body frame x, y, z with respect to this inner cell x, y, z actually. Okay, that is our objective here. So, what you really want to do? Like, let us say uh, first we want to take this in this coordinate system, just translate it over there. Okay, then to try to rotate uh, some this this coordinate system one at a time. Okay, first uh, with respect to z axis, then with respect to y, then with respect to x, things like that. Ultimately, our aim is to the, this translated coordinate system should coincide with this body axis frame actually. Then whatever angles we require, those angles are uh, nothing but these angles psi theta phi actually. Okay. So let's uh, try to understand a little better. So what you first, we, first what you are interested is uh, taking this coordinate system over there. Simply translate that. 
and we have to have uh, some different notation there just not to get confused with that. So, this x dash uh, or x prime y prime z prime is rewritten in terms of x 1 y 1 z 1 this is simply just translated over there nothing more actually ok. Now, this x 1 y 1 z 1 I can rotate it with respect to the body x axis well, with respect to the body z axis ok. So, that this entire x y frame whatever x, x y frame was there previously ok it will try to coincide with this x y actually ok. So, this x 1 y 1 what you what you had by translating this first this uh, inertial coordinate over over there. Now, I will rotate it by angle psi with respect to the body z axis ok z axis is your uh, probably middle finger in your left hand side actually. So, this z axis you have to rotate it uh, with z axis you keep it fixed and rotate it by angle psi and that is what the picture says actually ok. So, that is uh, that is what you will do and the next what you will do is this rotated frame whatever is there you rotate it by angle theta about the y axis. So, first with respect to z axis then with respect to y axis and ultimately with respect to x axis phi that is what you will do here ok. So, the sequence of rotations are uh, so psi theta and phi and this sequence of rotation is the translated inertial coordinate system which gets rotated about its axis actually. So, that ultimately it coincides with the body frame ok. Yeah. So, this is the this is the uh, concept actually. Now, let us try to see the relationship between them and any time you know the, the, the essentially what you are doing we are actually doing it a one angle rotation of a two dimensional axis frame at one point of time because one about one axis you are rotating. So, that particular axis remains fixed and then the, the remaining coordinate system moves in in one angle in 2 d actually ok. So, let us uh, let us try to see what is going on here. So, first we are doing that this coordinate frame we just translate there ok. So, essentially this uh, whatever dots you have in the inner cell frame these are nothing but u 1 v 1 w 1. Okay, this is uh, simply translation. So, the velocity quantities do not change actually, but after that there is a rotation and then uh, it is a 2 d rotation, but you want to visualize that in 3 d actually. So, w 1 as the, this particular picture if you see that is the angle psi actually ok. So, this angle psi happens to take this u u 2 v 2 to u 1 v 1 that means, whatever u 1 v 1 is there ok. Suppose, you already have u 2 v 2 then what is u 1 v 1 actually ok. That relationship comes through this rotational 2 d rotational matrix we know probably. So, and if you do not know you can see some coordinate geometry book or something there which is very standard ok. So, there are some neat properties out there this uh, for example, the the determinant of this matrix is always 1. So, if this matrix is never singular like anything like that actually. So, so, this is actually an orthonormal matrix also then there are various prop nice properties associated with that, but the fact is uh, this uh, suppose I have u 2 v 2 ok after the rotation then u 1 v 1 is is related by that that particular 2 d matrix here with respect to u 2 v 2 and w 1 is equal to w 2. So, this this becomes 0 0 and that becomes 0 0. So, you have 1 actually. So, this u 1 v 1 w 1 is related to u 2 v 2 w 2 that way. Then we have this next transformation by angle theta ok. So, this angle theta is with respect to u 3 and w 3 remember that because y axis remains fixed here ok. So, v 2 is equal to v 3 ok, but the other variables u 2 v 2 w 2 is related to v 3 v 3 w 3 because of that actually because of wrong angle this rotation angle theta. And similarly, this uh, x 3 y 3 z 3 goes to x y z by angle phi ultimately ok. Now, this is a rotation about x axis actually the transform x axis. So, all these rotation sequence of rotations once you try to combine them what do you combine? Let us say you want to have inertial posi uh, rate of change of uh, uh, position that means velocities which is nothing but that that is the definition in our because the definition that we are talking about the coordinate frame is x prime y prime z prime. So, I mean uh, normally I prefer to write it as x i dot y i dot z i dot at the end actually ok. So, that is related that is uh, same as this. And this is nothing but same as this because of translation right that is how we started with this is just translation here ok. But this translation is now given as the, that one that is just the second I mean the first translation. Then this translation what you see here is given by that that is the second translation I mean second uh, uh, rotation thing ok. This is translation this is first rotation over psi this is the second rotation and this is the third rotation. So, ultimately if you see the rate of change of position in your cell frame is related to phi theta psi all angles actually ok with respect to e b w 
So, if you if you know u v w components then x i dot y i dot z i dot is given by that actually this entire sequ entire uh, sequence of rotation and then you can simplify that you can multiply all these three matrices and then find out one vector equation at a time actually. All right, so that is that is about this uh, position rate of change of position in inertial from. So, if I use this uh, relationship then I will be able to plot the vehicle trajectory actually in the inertial frame. Now, obviously, this is a function of i theta size and then they also we know that this is also a function of i, I mean this uh, u dot v dot w dot is also a function of theta and phi. So, obviously, we want to know uh, this uh, phi dot theta dot psi dot as well actually. Okay, so, how they how do they vary actually? Now, obviously, they are related to this body rate of rotations p q r. See the phi theta side is what this uh, this inertial coordinate frame rotations in a sequential way and p q r is nothing but the body rate of rotation about the body axis of the vehicle itself. Okay. So, in a vectorial sense you can tell ok i j k is the body frame unit vectors. Okay. So, this uh, w bar is uh, I, p, I times p plus uh, j times q plus k times r which is also equal to vectorially speaking psi dot theta dot and phi dot together. Now, this is the same vector there are two different uh, uh, this one uh, coordinate system actually this is written in terms of body axis and this is written in terms of inertial frame actually a sequence of operations essentially. So, vectorially speaking these two are equal ok. Now, we have to try to find out what all go, what all goes in there now vectorially speaking psi dot is nothing but k 1 times uh, psi dot. Okay. So, remember this uh, whatever we did here this x 1 y 1 z 1 stands for k 1 I mean uh, i 1 j 1 k 1 x 2 y 2 z 2 stands for i 2 z 2 k 2 like that actually. Okay. So, in that sense uh, if you can uh, see that this psi dot is essentially k 1 times psi dot because that is the first operation what you did actually okay. and essentially k 1 and k 2 remain same because that is rotation about z 1 axis k component will remain same remember i j k stands for x y z. So, k stands for z component and this is a rotation about z axis. So, k component remains same actually. So, I can I can write it that way. Similarly, theta dot is essentially j 2 because that is second operation remember that. So, the because it is a second operation this theta bar I mean theta bar dot is nothing but j 2 theta dot which is also equal to j 3 theta dot because that is the rotation about y 2 now ok and similarly phi dot is, is like this actually. So, it is rotation about x 3. All right, so this is this is how uh, this vectorial notations can be decomposed to. Now we have to uh, so simplify this uh, this k two i j three i three all sort of things. We have to put it in single framework and then try to kind of see the relationship between them actually. Okay, so if you uh, let's do that, then what happens? This k two okay, I can I can write it as something like this i three and k three sort of thing. Essentially, you can write it into uh, something like uh, I, I 2 and k 2 as a function of i 3 and k 3 the, the way I have written it here the below. So, this is what is written as j 3 and k 3 are related to j and k like this remember j k stands for body axis and j 3 k 3 stands for just before that ok last rotation is pi ok. okay. So, this list relationship like that similarly you can write it in terms of theta also you know that means uh, i 2 and k 2 with theta theta is between x and z remember that. So, i 2 and k 2 will be a similar relationship will pop up for i 3 and k 3 ok. So, that I need only the component of that I need only the k 2 component actually. So, I just taken out that one. Now, z 3 and k 3 are given like that. So, using this relationship ok this ent entire thing whatever whatever you have see this this vectorial dots I can represent this like this actually right. This is like k 2 times i dot plus j 3 times theta dot plus uh, plus i 3 times phi dot if I want to do that. And then I, I kind of simplify all these because k 2 is like this j 3 k 3 are like that. So, I put them together and then that is ultimately equal to i, I times p plus j times q plus k times r. Now, that is where this we started with actually ok. So, I have I started with all these ok and then try to write all in terms of body coordinate frame this uh, phi dot theta dot psi dot and that is equal to this i times p plus j times q plus k times r. So, now I can equate this component by component because these three are orthogonal quantities i j k are orthogonal to each other. So, I can come I can uh, equate these quantities component by component actually ok. So, let us do that and then we will have this relationship. So, if you if you try to use this component by component and then this this relationship will pop up actually ok. So, vectorially speaking I can write it that way ok. 
but normally what we do not want p q r as a function of phi dot theta dot psi dot we want the reverse one we want phi dot theta dot psi dot as a function of p q r that is the dynamic sequence equation right that is what you want to integrate later. So, what do you do I, I can take a inverse transformation here actually ok. So, this inverse transformation I can carry out and if you sit down with this in a inverse calculation there is a 1 by determinant time set z matrix and then you simplify all sort of things then it will it will pop up like this actually. So, so what you have ultimately we have this uh, we have this uh, um, x i dot y i dot z i dot which will give us the trajectory part of it and associated with that we have this phi dot theta dot psi dot also everything needs to be integrated together uh, because these are all coupled equations actually ok. So, uh, th and then this is not uh, end of the story we have this uh, I mean uh, uh, you, uh, you also see that these components we last class we just derived from um, from simple logic simple intuition. Now, can we do it in a formal way actually. So, what part of this will go to u dot what part will go to v dot and things like that. So, if you let us try to quickly do that and this is essentially the same way remember gravity is is perpendicular to the I mean parallel to the inertial z axis all the time no matter whatever is the vehicle attitude gravity is always vertical with respect to surface of earth actually. So, that means it is always parallel to the z axis it is always pointed to the center actually earth center. So, that way this this particular vector now this need not be oriented with with respect to body axis actually body x y z. However, because this is orthogonal frame which spans this entire 3D space. So, the g vector any particular vector and in particularly this uh, this gravity vector I can decompose that into x y z components and that is what I am doing actually ok. So, k 1 times z I am decomposing that in, in terms of i j k actually here. So, g x g y g z uh, stands for the component of the gravity in body x body y and body z component body z coordinate frame actually. So, what part goes where that is that is the question actually ok. And also note that, that psi does not affect the component of gravity because k 1 is equal to k 2. So, anytime the vehicle takes a rotation uh, parallel to the surface of earth ok that means, uh, uh, with some some psi rotation actually then the gravity is uh, still pointed vertically actually that means, the, the z vector whatever it happens it does not affect it. Gra gravity uh, the in other words the, the rotation psi does not affect the gravity components at all actually ok. Essentially under the flat earth assumption I mean if you uh, earth is flat. So, if they takes uh, some psi rotation somewhere then uh, the, it does not affect anything about the body x y z actually. So, we will not uh, worry so much about that what we really need is uh, is phi and theta components actually ok. So, they are essentially functions of phi and theta okay. because if the moment there is a theta component the the I mean the pitch pitch angle theta essentially these are and phi angle is also roll angle actually ok. So, pitching and rolling essentially uh, I mean they they will make the components of gravity different in the in terms of x y z but uh, yawing does not uh, normally affect it actually under the flat earth assumption. So, what you what you see here uh, your i 3 is again i ok that is ultimately ultimately your body axis ok that is the final rotation and then k 3 is equal to this k times cos phi plus j times sin phi ok. So, and k 2 is uh, the other one. So, k 3 and uh, k 2 is like this it is a function of uh, theta obviously ok right and theta is related to i and k. So, phi is related to k and j like that. So, if you do a proper bookkeeping then k 2 turns out to be something like that. However, k 1 is equal to k 2. So, that means, you can substitute this uh, this uh, relationship and then you see that k 1 g ok is essentially like that actually ok. Whatever you see here i j k ok whatever components comes in i and j and k these are body 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 x y z components and this is this is also body x y z component ok. So, if you equate the two you get these things actually ok. And uh, in last class we just derived it intuitively, but this is much more formal way of uh, deriving it actually using this Euler angle rotations actually. So, this is how the entire sex of equation is uh, uh, made out. but before going there. So, last previous lecture we have seen the dynamic level equations here we see the kinematic level equations that means uh, velocity level equation these are uh, angular velocity terms and these are uh, translational velocity terms ok. So, this uh, this six equations coupled with the previous six equation what we saw that last class uh, derives the I mean gives the complete set of six dot equations. So, which is uh, which is here 
ok. So, you see this this consists of u dot v dot w dot p dot q dot r dot then phi dot theta dot psi dot and x x i dot y i dot z i dot ok. So, these 12 equations will derive that and normally this height dot h dot is actually negative of z i dot ok. So, that is uh, if you simply take out the last row and make a negative sign then it will whatever pops up is nothing but h dot actually. So, that is not an independent equation ok. So, what is uh, what is relevant here is only these 12 equations actually. And fundamentally speaking, this uh, this twelve equation gives uh, this uh, first six equations are uh, directly related to the body axis only, and the last six equation are uh, gives a relationship between inertial frame and body frame actually, especially this phi dot theta dot psi dot, and then this x y dot x i dot y i dot z i dot gives us the trajectory of the vehicle in the as seen from the inertial coordinate frame. Okay, so this is how it is all uh, coupled together, sort of thing. Now, this is set of equation what you see here, these are Coriolis quantities, okay. these are gravity and these are force uh, quantities actually. And then uh, uh, I mean if you go ahead and see that this is the C 1 and C 2 all these things we saw that last class also, whatever C 1, C 2, C 3, C 3, I mean all this uh, C with a suff suffix what you see here in p dot q dot r dot equations are essentially functions of moment of inertia which is which is given like that actually, we have derived that in the last class. Okay, rest of the equations are kinematic equations, so which are uh, given here actually. Okay, and then this this uh, whatever you see, the, these components are actually this uh, external forces and moments are the only ones which are different from vehicle to vehicle. Everything, all rest of the things are are same, no matter whether a bird flies. Uh, uh, of course, bird has to be rigid body, which which is not really true. But whether any flying object which is a rigid body, okay. Which is dict uh, which is governed by all these set of equations actually. Okay. The only difference comes is because of this external forces and moments, and that is where lot of study goes uh, goes into for in the aerodynamics study actually. Uh, aero so this this is like aerodynamic component x y z l n m, and x t y t z t and l t n m t n t are nothing but thrust components. So thrust components are not very difficult to visualize. It, it doesn't vary unless you have a thrust deflection mechanism, which happens in in missiles and launch vehicles, especially with some fighter aircrafts. We have thrust deflection mechanism also for better maneuverability and all, all that actually. But normally, this X Y, this commercial aircraft sort of thing, X, these are fairly known actually. It all depends on engine power, how much you do, and what orientation you are fixed actually. That that is where it, this phi uh, t and psi t are, are coming actually. Phi t psi t are not are not Euler angles. But they are the angles in engine orientation angles as fixed to the uh, I mean as, as seen in the inner as seen in the body frame. Okay, with respect to the body frame, these engines uh, are typically oriented by angle phi and psi for certain beneficial properties. Essentially, I'll not talk too much on that. But one com one thing that you can visualize is if it if it if it contributes something on the vertical direction, but inertial vertical direction, then essentially it helps uh, adding to the lift to sustain the weight actually. Okay, so you don't really have to have a very big wing okay, to sustain your lift. If thrust has a small component, let's say some sign of two degree or three degree, but, but thrust is a large quantity. So uh, that quantity inter multiplied by sine five degree also has a big quantity, which will which will add to the lift actually in a way. So like that, there are various ways. So then uh, they talk about uh, I mean jet should not uh, hit the tail wing so because the engine jet is there. So, it should never hit the tail wing actually, there is a very unpredictable radius I mean the circulation and all that. So, you want to have something like this way. So, the engine uh, engine uh, exhaust goes somewhere like that, it does not hit the vertical thing actually. Okay. So, there are various ways which uh, various the reasons why this these are all uh, done that way. And then uh, these aerodynamic forces and movements are typically generated two ways, one is uh, okay, there are three levels of doing that, okay, three or four levels you can say. Aerodynamic forces and moments. First thing people do is just a first cut guess actually, which comes from first principles. That is some something to start with. If you simply give the aircraft configuration, there are thumb rules available, basic relationships available, from which I can get a basic uh, idea of what the what is there. Then it goes to the next level of what is called CFD actually, so is computational fluid dynamics, where they talk about uh, Generating it in a grid point sense or for using finite element, finite volume, all sort of things, so this will give you a little more better accurate sense. Okay, remember, these are not the, the flow pattern over this uh, this aircraft body is not 
very much uh, in tune with uh, whatever assumptions we do in the first coat model. First coat model is all clean configuration, there is nothing there, I mean nothing objections are there, I mean the surface is fairly good and all sort of thing. So, going to one level of uh, higher, the CFD thing will account for all these uh, protrusions actually and then all sort of wing configuration, whether you have a fin out there, all sort of things it will take, uh, take into account and try to give a better accuracy on that. Then it goes to the next level when you go to pick people talk about wind tunnel study. So, this actually you, go, you I mean uh, most of the time it is actually a model of this prototype. I mean it is not a very big aircraft you cannot put in a wind tunnel. So, you do a small, smaller version of that and then try to uh, see in, instead of uh, the vehicle flowing in the in the medium, now medium is flown over the vehicle. That means, the air is flown over the vehicle essentially the relative velocity matters there. So, you can get a fairly better accuracy ideas, I mean better uh, idea about uh, this forces and movements. But this internal study can only talk about uh, um, uh, generating what is called a static forces and movements actually, dynamic level forces and movements it cannot generate. Uh, so, that means, which is whichever is the, the forces and movements that are components of this uh, rates, rotational rates for example, PQR, those components cannot be uh, predicted in a internal actually. So, for that you need the flight test. So, this it goes through several rounds of refinement okay, and then by meanwhile if your design configuration itself goes through refinement again you do one more round of wherever you want to start either from CFD or, or internal or flight test actually. So, that is where this models will keep on getting updated okay. then anything that is uh, generated from flight test that is essentially falls in the bracket of what is called parameter identification because that is where you want to identify the, the how these forces and movements actually act on the vehicle. So, it, so, roughly speaking this uh, this aerodynamic interaction of this vehicle is not very well understood actually from physics point of view. That is why we need to have several rounds of uh, experimental study and then combine with a deterministic model to get a fairly accurate model. That means, uh, this model what you are talking about you can visualize that say so it is some sort of a hybrid model. One is deterministic part there is a large component of that and there is a fairly equally good component of that which is aerodynamic dependent which are uh, somewhat uh, theoretically understood and there are components which are not understood, but then there are function feeds from the experiments actually. Okay, so, that is a largely uh, data driven in that sense. Okay. So, all these things are part of the six stop model actually. Okay. Now, before you go ahead there are some further comments. First thing is six stop model consists of 12 equations out of which three equations are decoupled with with I mean with the assumption that the earth is non rotating and flat earth is. like what I told on the last class if you see all these equations essentially the psi actually and then x y do not come in any of the rest of the equations actually. So, psi and x y you can probably decouple that and tell okay even if there is actually 12 equations under the non rotating flat earth assumption I can just work with 9 equation as far as local control design is concerned actually. Okay. So, and control design is typically local, it is a short duration stability problems and things like that, they are not uh, large long duration effects and all that. So, that is that is fairly okay. But uh, also remember that one still needs to integrate this x y and psi equations uh, to get the trajectory of the vehicle in your cell frame. Suppose you really want that and trajectory information is essentially embedded in the guidance design actually. So, if you really want to talk about a proper guidance design that means, uh, you start take off from point 1 and go to point 2 and things like that you really need this trajectory information. Okay. So, there you still need to integrate that and there are better models available under this uh, uh, spherical earth assumption and then uh, the rotating earth assumption and things like that actually. So, that is also there. So, okay, forgetting this factor whatever 9 equations are there uh, this this equation can be further reduced reduced to 8 equations because you tell okay locally the height does not change actually that means, that, uh, that uh, height dot h dot I do not I still can uh, I just consider a reference height and then h dot equation I do not have to integrate actually. Okay. I know where is what is my operational height which height I am not talking about and then I do not want to integrate to this h dot equation okay. height remains constant around that actually. So, then you the 8 is the 9 equations become 8 and out of that 8 equation we normally decouple that into 4 longitudinal equations and 4 lateral equations. Okay. These two we can visualize them as different actually. The, the weak, weak coupling that exists between the two under this uh, what is that uh, linearization approximation uh, we can neglect that actually. What I mean. Okay, so, this these 4 equations are uh, grouped together and other 4 equations are grouped together I will talk about that of course, 
and then you tell okay this this can be viewed that way actually. Then also remember that airplane is symmetry that is one of the assumptions. So, that is why this cross moment of inertias are 0 and missiles and launch vehicles are typical, typical symmetric about both the both x z plane and x y plane and hence all the three cross moment of inertias are 0. Okay. Then also remember that uh, this is not end of the story. We in, in flight dynamics people talk about various other frames. One of that is wind I mean stability frame, the other one is wind frame. So, the there are uh, neat uh, properties out of that, the especially this let us say this wind frame, the, the aerodynamic stripe, uh, lifts and uh, drag they typically act on the wind frame. Okay. So, some about this so this experiment sometimes the wind tunnel data will be given in terms of stability frame. Okay. So, what is this? A stability frame is nothing but uh, like a body frame, okay, just to rotate the body frame okay, uh, uh, by angle, al angle alpha about the y axis, y axis remains same okay, and then you rotate whatever x, x z axis by angle alpha, okay. that, that will give you the stability frame and wind frame is that uh, stability frame you rotate further by angle beta, which is, which is in a, something called side slip angle. Okay, so, it will perfectly align the x vector of the wind frame will be perfectly aligned to the uh, to the extreme velocity actually. Okay, so, that is how you get the wind frame actually. So, details I will not talk about, but again these are all rotations only. So, rotation things are uh, again this relationship will be reflected by this rotational matrix through this rotation matrix that cos alpha cos alpha in the diagonal and minus, minus sin alpha and plus sin alpha in the off diagonal elements actually. Okay, so, these are details and all you can find out in flight dynamics books and one of the books is probably Stevens and Lewis with uh, aircraft control and all that itself, aircraft simulation and control I believe. All right, so, let us move further and then we talk about okay, what I what I just pointed out, uh, uh, can we discuss something called small disturbance flight dynamics, that means local effects, okay, you do not talk about the nonlinear effect, uh, everything coupled and things like that. So, can we do some sort of a decoupled motion longitudinal lateral and things like that with small disturbance uh, assumption actually and many of this material I will take it from this this particular book which uh, which is also I think very well written for these concepts. Okay. So, what you are doing roughly what you are doing is all the variables okay, whatever you had in the sixth of dynamics you interpret that as perturbations around some nominal values that for example, u 0, v 0, w 0 all sort of thing these are all nominal values around which there are perturbations actually delta v delta w I mean delta w all sort of thing and the assumption is this perturbations are small actually. So, what you do the in the linearization which I think we will uh, not discuss yet, but uh, one of the further classes will discuss about that formally. So, in the Taylor series expansion you neglect the higher order terms of these quantities actually ok you, you can you, you have the 6 of say, six degree of freedom equation that is a non-linear coupled equation. So, you want to linearize this around some nominal operating condition actually. So, this uh, and these variables with subscript 0 are operating conditions and then this uh, perturbation quantities uh, you assume them as small and try in then put that in the Taylor series expansion and then neglect the higher order terms actually. Okay. Then you can do you can do it in a different way also I mean if you see that book especially it is done slightly in a different way but that is ok. So, wha what essentially it does actually then so first you have to find out <laughs> first you have to find out this operating point actually like you need to find out what all these uh, this u 0, v 0, p 0, q 0 all sort of thing actually. So, for that uh, there are various steady state uh, conditions available which is called trim condition actually and trim does not necessarily mean straight and level flight, but that is one of the very typical trim condition. If it goes straight and level that is actually like a steady state condition, condition which is essentially called as trim condition actually. Yeah. Okay, but there are various other trim conditions also available. Okay, stream condition means nothing changes your uh, your control surface and all that are, are reflected by a constant quantity. Okay. Then suppose you want to take a vertical loop, okay, it can also be considered as a trim, okay, horizontal circles and all that you can also be considered as a trim and things like that. But most popular thing is straight and level flight. If I just go straight and level and then uh, do some uh, stability analysis around that actually. Okay. All right. So, what we assume here is straight and level flight, all this V 0 and P Q R 0 like V 0, Q 0, R 0, these are rotational rates, V 0 is the velocity component along body y. Okay. So, these quantities are all 0 and these are like force in I mean force quantities in the y and z direction coming out of thrust actually okay. and typically these are uh, true for all time. Uh, so, body body y and z component thrust does not contribute uh, any component largely, 
especially in commercial flights etc. Okay, so then, uh, so under these assumptions, okay, you select these quantities. That means you tell, okay, what is my thrust level, thrust force? There is, a, there is an engine. I, I want to operate in five percent of thrust, ten percent of thrust, fifteen percent of thrust, whatever it is. The maximum thrust, what I mean. Uh, so you fix that thrust quantity, and then fix what height you want to fly. I say the vehicle flies. So once you do this, that means all these variables are either zero or known. Okay. Then you want to enforce. Remember, these nine equations are there for us. Okay, so all these nine equations should uh, should uh, I mean the rate of those uh, variables should be zero. There, there is no uh, I mean this uh, rate of change actually for all these u dot v dot w dot also p dot q dot r dot phi dot theta dot and z i dot. This is the height part of it actually. Okay, so all these quantities, if I force it to zero, this will essentially give me various free variables. And out of these three variables, I know this, okay, and I have to find out this actually. And remember, this is just one way of finding the trim trim condition. There are other ways also, basically. So what I mean, I mean, the, essentially, you are somehow making sure that uh, this happens to be zero. All these rate rate of change happens to be zero actually. And then you solve for that, okay. And in that process, you can also verify that what you really get, okay, that also has to be zero actually, okay. All right, so you just verify that uh, that there is no force uh, from aerodynamics y has to be zero, no moments also from aerodynamics about the body axis actually. That's just verification. I mean, uh, if, there is, if that doesn't satisfy, then there is something wrong here actually. Probably you can go back. So you solve this. So essentially, what I mean is all these uh, variables with subscript zero are now available actually. Okay. Now you can take okay this aerodynamic forces and moments, this perturbation around that. Okay. I can visualize in Taylor series expansion, and I want to keep the major components only. Okay, and the, this series doesn't stop actually. Suppose somebody wants to write this is a, a other functionalities actually, then they can still write it. But as far as perturbation in delta x is concerned, they remember this delta x is the aerodynamic force in body x direction actually. Okay, and then this aerodynamic force can be function of u, function of delta w, function of uh, delta e, function of delta thrust, all sort of things. Okay. And if this series can be expanded also, okay. but these are these are the major components actually. By the way, this way of writing is something called component build up actually. Okay. So component by component, you are building up whatever whatever components come here ultimately actually. Okay. Similarly, delta y you expand and delta z you expand, and delta l, delta m, delta n also you expand actually. Okay. Then you can you can write this. Okay. Then the the interdependencies if you see. Okay. Out of that, see if I club these variables together, delta u, delta w, delta q, and delta theta, they become independent of the rest of the equation. They become only functions of themselves and these two quantities, delta e and delta t. Actually. Okay, so essentially, I'll be able to write this x dot equal to x plus v u. What we know, I mean, uh, uh, state space equation form basically. So linearized state space equation form for longitudinal dynamics happens to be like that. It's a it's a four dimensional system. Where state and control are defined like that, and for notational simplicity, these are also defined that way. Okay, x u means this del x by del u with one over m normalization. That's a this is uh, well acceleration quantity. X is a force quantity, but x u is acceleration quantity actually. One by m, so it is just, uh, the force divided by m becomes something like uh, acceleration quantity basically. Anyway, so with these not notations intact, these all this whatever you see here in the matrix. Will turn out to be like that. So in flight dynamics, suppose somebody gives us this A and B matrix numbers. These numbers essentially mean these quantities actually. So that means they are coming from there, and these, right? So that is that's that's the thing, and it is they are nice uh, nice consequences actually. Now I can I can further divide this uh, this uh, four by four into two two by two systems. Okay. And then I'll take okay one time I'll talk about uh, this delta u delta theta together okay out of that delta u and delta theta together other time I'll consider delta w and delta q together in a way they are all large okay, which is a function of what and things like that I mean that's uh, that that's what it turns out and there are two types of nice perturbation happens actually in the in the study around the steady state level flight so one thing is which is which is called as Fugoid mode. Essentially, the aircraft uh, drops its heights to a significant thing and then goes off. Actually, the vehicle attitude doesn't change. Okay, attitude remains same. The entire vehicle will keep on going and then coming down and then go. It's like a roller coaster ride. Actually, okay. 
So, this uh, this happens with some something like constant angle of attack actually ok. So, under these assumptions uh, delta alpha becomes 0 because alpha remains constant and then because delta alpha delta alpha is, is defined that way. So, delta w also becomes 0. So, you are left out with this uh, this nice small matrix and uh, I mean uh, homogeneous linear system which you can analyze it very clearly. This is a second order system in a way okay, delta u and delta theta just analyze together basically. So, you can uh, you can find out the Eisen values and then uh, you can tell ok uh, you can write it as a second order equation and then tell ok this uh, s square plus 2 zeta omega n s plus uh, omega n square equal to 0 that kind of equation you can write and tell ok this omega n turns out to be like that and zeta turns out to be like that. So, in the figured mode there is a natural frequency and there is a natural damping ok which are actually given like that and the motion is something like that ok. It will go to a maximum speed at the down then it will again pick up and then it is a minimum speed at the top ok. Then it will come down and it will proceed. This is a nice roller coaster ride actually. Obviously, nobody in the passenger aircraft will like that. So, you want to control that also basically. Okay. Now, similarly, there is another motion which is called uh, short period that means, uh, this does a high the vehicle does not go through a large amount of uh, height uh, variation. However, there is a vibration around that. So, this happens to be ok, this happens to be something like this actually ok. So, this uh, uh, this oscillation uh, this uh, that uh, uh, oscillation about this uh, vehicle y axis sort of thing. But this is actually a little more unpleasant experience actually for the passengers. So, what happens there is, uh, is a change of angle of attack and this oscillation ok fortunately happens to be heavily damped actually. So, that means, these oscillations typically die out, die out first and some of these we might have experienced uh, while uh, commercial flights sometimes this wind gust and all that they are they, also, they naturally die down actually also without too much of control action or control can be excited also by for that. Well, suppose then the, the damping is not satisfactory, then obviously we need a control for that also. And both of these are actually controlled by L, I mean elevator actually. You have elevator, L1 and, and rudder. So, these are longitudinal motions okay, and these are functions of elevator actually okay. delta E remember that here. Okay. So, this delta E quantity what you see here is actually largely I mean utilized for suppressing these two phenomena actually. So, this is again short period mode. So, again you can uh, I mean you can visualize the dynamics in terms of delta w and delta q again a 2 by 2 matrix again you can do this natural I mean uh, frequency and damping ratio actually it happens to be like that. And remember these are all functions of aerodynamic parameters which are also functions of vehicle configuration ok. So, so like that actually. Now, similarly in the lateral dynamics you can decompose that into again 4 more variables which are not uh, same as the other variables. Here you talk about V, P, R and phi, phi is the roll angle name of that and then the A and B matrices are given like that okay, all these parameter values and all. And similarly, because if it is I x z is also 0 which happens to be in missiles and all that then this this whatever you see here it will further reduce to this uh, rather simple looking form ok and this will uh, turn out to be like that actually ok. So, aircraft uh, response uh, as far as that is concerned uh, you can see that in this uh, lateral dynamics there are two modes again one is spiral mode another is rolling mode and there is a dutch roll motion also okay, which is a couple between these two. So, let us see what is that. So, this is a spiral mode I mean directional divergence first. So, what it does is this does not possess too much of directional stability. So, in other words there will be a, a increase of uh, this uh, side slip angle beta. So, the u v w component remember that. So, the v component starts building up actually ok. If the v component starts building up then the vehicle will largely deviate from its intentional path. In a long duration it, it is supposed to go in that direction but it will not go there it will try to deviate that. And then uh, at some point of time beta will couple with phi and then it roll dynamics will start all sort of things actually. Okay. So, that is that is direct what is called directional divergence. The other one is spiral divergence which is actually largely responsible from and this uh, ok uh, gr gradual spiraling motion actually that means, the, so the, the rolling stability suppose the vehicle starts rolling and all that actually ok. Then it will also lead to EI that we know that the, the moment the vehicle rolls it yaws also. So, if that is not stable then it will excite a spiral mode that means, this radius of curvature becomes very fast and it also loses height and it crosses actually ultimately. 
So, these, these two are actually directional divergence is not that bad. In other words, if, if it is not controlled in time, then it will lead to bad, further bad things. But this is even more further bad in the beginning itself because it rolled this uh, spiraling action gets amplified very quickly actually. Okay, so, then uh, it is uh, this, this particular aspect is largely controlled by rudder and this particular effect is largely controlled by L run picture. Remember, it is a motion due to phi roll angle, this is a motion due to beta. Okay, so, beta is uh, side slip angle. So, beta is controlled largely through L, through rudder and uh, roll is largely controlled through L run picture. Okay. So, then there is a nice uh, coupling with the two. Okay, this, this is what is called Dutch roll oscillation. So, here it is it will the, the directional and spiral oscillations will be coupled together actually. It will it will roll and hence it will beta will build up, it will go somewhere, then it will stabilize, I mean it will start in the opposite direction sort of thing and then it will go like this and then it will go like that and it is uh, this keep on remember this uh, amplitude keeps on building also. And this uh, typical name comes from this uh, ice skating actually, okay, when you do ice skating this is one side you go something and then you come back to the other side and things like that actually. So, that is typically does people like that ice skating and all. So, that is how it uh, the terminology has been given actually. So, time period can be of 3 to 15 second and then typically this yaw damper is used. Yaw damper is largely by the way you design the vertical fin, the, the part of the tail, vertical tail which is ahead of the rudder. That vertical fin if you define it properly, if you design it properly then that will cause the proper yaw damping actually. But in addition to that, you can al always control it using both uh, L1 and L2 together. Okay. Because this motion you cannot decouple into 2 2 by 2 system. You have to talk at least about 1 4 by 4 system. Okay. And then where this both L1 and, uh, and this one uh, rudder will come and hence you design them together. That is the power of this state space uh, design approach. You talk about the coupling effect also in the design process actually. Okay. Now, before you stop this class, I will also take you through some various attitude representation, which is uh, this entire 6 drop and all we derived in terms of Euler angles, but that is uh, there is a strong drawback for that. And uh, we will see that and then we will there are also alternative attitude representation people have thought about seriously actually. And these problems are further amplified if you have this uh, satellite control problem for example, or missile dynamics which, which have large angle of rotations coming into picture. Okay, so, to satellites can tumble, it can completely turn 360 degrees and keep on doing that actually in the space. And hence, the missiles also, they are high angle of attack maneuvers, you can take quick turns and all that. So, large angles when you talk about, these earlier angles are typically not good actually. So, we want to have some other thing. So, let us see that. So, attitude representation by definition is essentially the attitude coordinates or set of parameters that completely describe the orientation of a rigid body relative to some reference frame. And one set we have already seen Euler angles. The other thing that are available to us is direction cosines and quaternions. In fact, direction cosines are the first step before even Euler angles. And then the, it does not stop here. The people talk about uh, well Rodrigue's parameter, then modified Rodrigue's parameter, and the, and the family of that actually. Okay, there are given types actually. Okay. So, broad class all these parameters what you see there are two broad classes one is like a three parameter representation and another is a four parameter representation essentially quaternions fall in that four parameter representation. So, three parameter representations are nice because the attitude uh, is actually a three parameter representation whatever you see any attitude is three angles somehow. Okay. But uh, there are there is a serious problem Okay, we will see that. And then, uh, uh, and especially, okay, if you want to quickly look at that, I can also go there and come back probably. See this, uh, this Euler angle representation, if you see it here, there is a 10 theta term involved, okay, right, what you see here. And 10 theta is sin theta by cos theta and here is a sec theta, which is also 1 by cos theta. So, that means, if theta goes to 90, then the cos theta becomes 0 and there is something divided by 0, which means these rates will go to infinity. That is something called Zimmer log actually. That means, no matter whatever degree of accuracy you use, delta t take it to very small quantity, even then the integration cannot be done. This uh, this dots go to infinity. The, the angles are okay, okay, the angle values are fine, but the rate of change goes to infinity actually, which is not nice. So, this set of and this uh, rate of change is actually a function of the sequence of rotation, how you do that. You did that sequence of rotation from psi theta phi. If you do a different set of equation, then it the variable with some 10 theta will appear happen to be 10 phi or 10 psi. Okay. Somewhere you will be getting locked actually. So, there is no way you can get out of this, this mechanism actually. 
Okay, so that is where it happens, and this is this is actually bad because it happens in 90 degree. 90 degree is a small angle. Now the whole idea of this MRP and all that modified optics parameter, they have already taken into something called 360 degree or multiples of 360 degree. Then only you will have singularity. So one full round you can take, and then still can avoid singularity and all that. And you can still talk about three parameter representation, which is nice. The three to three is actually like there is a, I mean this redundancy variable doesn't come into picture actually. So that is that is why. So let's talk about that now, and then okay. So first is the direction cosine. So direction cosine is if you have a, if you have a reference frame, okay, and if you have a vector, any vector, I can talk about direct angles actually, right? This vector, whatever I have, I can take direct angles with respect to these uh, these axes, okay. and if I take cosines of those angles, okay, and put them in a matrix form, then this is the matrix that I'm talking as direction cosine matrix, okay. Understood? That means the components of this vector, whatever this vector, this this something like a B1 component, B2 component, B3 component, each of the components, what I what I mean, they will have direct angles with respect to this uh, this other frame. Uh, see, there are two frames, one is N frame and one is B frame. Okay. You, you can visualize the N frame as inner cell frame and the B frame as body frame. Okay. So each of the components of the body frame makes an angle with all the three axes of the inner cell frame directly. So that means you have nine such equations actually. Okay. So, uh, 9 such representations actually. So, all these things if I put them together then the B frame is related to the N frame through a matrix representation which is directly like cosine I mean the cosine terms and all that we know that. If you take dot products and you can derive it actually that is not a problem. The two vectors if you take dot product that will the cosine angle will come into picture and that is why these cosine terms come actually. Okay. So, this this uh, this B what results from this uh, this algebra is something uh, related related to n through the C matrix and C matrix is essentially called direction cosine matrix. That is that is the definition actually. Now, remember we really require 3, but you have 9 parameters actually. That means, there are 6 redundancies here. That is the problem here actually. Okay. Now, before doing that, before we even talk about that, let us observe some nice properties that C is essentially an orthogonal matrix. An orthogonal matrix has a nice property that C times C transpose is actually identity. That means, inverse of this matrix is transpose. And inverse is all inverse always exists. Okay, so there are nice properties of that actually. Okay, inverse is transpose and determinant of this is always plus or minus one depending on what angles it takes. And uh, as I told, direction cosine is probably the most fundamental, most natural way of visualizing things. But it is also highly redundant, uh, and because of this, uh, we require three. But it has given us nine parameters actually. Okay, so nine entries. So, 6 extra parameters are redundant through this orthogonality condition basically. Okay. Orthogonality condition tells us that each of the vector, this vector is orthogonal to that and this vector is orthogonal to that and because this vector matrix is orthogonal, the vectors are also orthonormal. So, if I take dot products of any two rows actually, okay, they are zeros and if I take norm of any row, that will happen to be 1. Okay. These are orthonormal, each of the vectors are orthonormal to each other actually. Okay, so, that is those are the redundancies that I am talking. So, you have this combination sense, three combinations of dot products and then three normalization quantities actually. Okay, so, these six redundancies you have to talk about actually. Okay. Now, Euler angles we have discussed everything on that uh, probably, but still to visualize that the standard set of Euler angles is what we have done. It is a psi theta phi rotation actually, okay. but this is also called asymmetric set. What people use in uh, satellite dynamics and all is what is called as 313 set of rotations actually. Okay. So, this is, uh, we will not talk too much on that anyway, but that is also called something called symmetric set actually. Okay. You do not have to rotate it to using this 3 to 1 actually. You can also go for 313. 3 means 3 stands for psi, 2 stands for theta and 1 stands for phi. So, what you are to talking here is psi, phi and again psi. Okay. You can also do that actually. That is typically standard for satellite dynamics and all. And then, uh, okay, there is a direction cosine matrix. Can we parameterize in terms of Euler angles? We will see that relationship also. And obviously, Euler angles so define successive rotations and all. We discussed about that. So, this is the representation actually. Like if you have Euler angles, okay, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, I am not writing in terms of theta phi psi. You can also write in terms of 1, 2, 3 notation actually theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, then the direction cosine matrix turns out to be like that, where C theta stands for cos theta and S theta stands for 
sin theta especially. Then out once you did that do that then this psi theta phi can also be given in terms of inverse transformation that that means somebody gives me the direction cosine matrix then I can also recover this other angle quantity. So, there are vacant for transformations available actually. Okay, if once you know one representation, you can find out the representation of the one actually. Okay, so then then finally let's uh, talk a little bit on quaternions. Quaternions is essentially to get rid of the singularity problem. Now, is unfortunately, what happens is anything that you use, either your direction cosine, Euler angle, modified orbit parameter, whatever you use, all these three parameter representation do suffer from singularity. It's a matter of where the singularity occurs, but it has a singularity. Now, can you talk about singularity free transformation and that is where this quaternion algebra is useful actually. So, what it, what it turns out we will come back to this probably, but the, the that is the fundamental thing is something here. So, for every attitude change that I am talking about, I can always visualize some axis somewhere around which I can take one rotation and finish it off. Okay, this is for all the sequence of rotation that I am talking from inertial to body whatever one axis frame to other axis frame there is one vector what is called the principal rotation vector around which I can take one rotation. So, that this two axis will merge together actually that is the concept that is the theorem actually. Okay. Now, obviously, we have to we have to design that axis frame and that is given by three quantities q 1, q 2, q 3 and then there will be something like uh, one rotation quantity is also you have to discuss about that is the quantity phi actually. So, quaternion will consist of four parameters q 0 and then q 1, q 2, q 3. Okay. Q 1, q 2, q 3 will typically give some sort of a something like a direction of this rotation vector and then uh, uh, is the phi angle which you can do take out from this q 0 component actually. Okay. Phi by 2 is cosine inverse of q 0 basically that way. This phi angle is a rotation about that vector which will make it coincident actually on the thing. Now, going back to that this is uh, this is the quaternion form this q 0 plus q bar, q bar consists of q 1, q 2, q 3 and then there is a I mean this i j k you can see that there, there are the square of that and i times k times j all equal to minus 1 there is some neat algebra associated with that actually. Okay. So, you can see some of these and equality sense also like uh, there are various further things I think uh, uh, some of you who are interested in this you can see this uh, this particular book which I have, I have taken it from actually analytical mechanics and of space system this is a nice chapter for doing all this actually. Okay, so, anyway, so coming back to this, uh, this uh, so addition you can define it that way. Suppose you have two quaternions, let us say P and Q. So, P will have P0 plus P1, P2, P3, Q will have Q0 plus Q1, Q2, Q3, and then with respect to that, you can define addition, multiplication like that actually. Then there is a conjugate quaternion, which is uh, negative of all these quantities, and the norm of the quaternion is defined like that. Okay. So, obviously, this q square this whatever whatever you see here is actually 1 q 0 q square q 0 square plus q 1 square plus q 2 square plus q 3 square happens to be 1 actually that is called unit quaternion. Okay. So, that is actually a restraint that is a constraint that you have to operate with actually. Okay. So, that is how you can define this quaternion. Okay. So, this is actually a restraint that is a constraint that you have to operate with actually. So, all these parameters this has to satisfy that and that happens to be a problem in numerical integration for which we need to normalize it forcefully and with there is for which there is no unique way of doing that that is the difficulty there actually. Okay. So, quaternion now also satisfy this uh, quaternion two Euler angle suppose you know Euler angle then you can find out quaternion suppose you know quaternions you can find out the direction cosine matrix things like that there are there are transformations available which you can extract one information from the other actually. So, I request you to see some of these chapters for more details ok this is a control theory class so it cannot talk too much detail on that, but with uh, with all sort of this flight mechanics ideas and all that we will be able to you utilize our control theory ideas for flight control and guidance design actually that is my motivation. So, with that I will probably stop this class thanks for the attention.